Great. Well, I'll start by saying thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you tonight. I know, I understand that it's an exam block, so thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your study, and I guess this is a valid excuse for not studying. I guess you can take it a break and consider it to be an academic pursuit in some way. So what I want to do tonight is just talk a little bit about jobs and careers and what it is that you can start doing now so that you have the job and the career that you want to have. And so I'm going to try to make this something that's going to be useful um, as you, as whether you're a senior, junior, whatever year you are, at some point you're going to be going through the interview process and getting a job and starting that. So I want to talk about that. First, by just a, a little bit of introduction as to why it is that I'm here talking to you. Um, my name is Brian Hawk. I've been involved in accountancy exam training for over 20 years. Um, it's really been, in, for 20 years, I've been preparing people to pass the CPA exam. My background in exam training is a little bit different because it started in Russia. I moved to Russia. I graduated from Miami of Ohio uh, in 1994. And in September of 1994, moved to Russia as an auditor with Price Waterhouse. Spent a couple of years, actually less than a couple of years, as an auditor before I got into the training business. First with the training department of Price Waterhouse, doing a lot of their internal training. Then I worked for a British training company, doing training for all the big six, I think it was at that time. And then in the year 2000, I started my own training company in Moscow called Hawk Accountancy Training. And our first business was CPA. I taught Russian auditors to pass the CPA exam. At that time, the exam was twice a year on two days. And so in May and November, 40 Russians and I would fly over to either New Hampshire or Maine is where we were taking the exam. And I'd bus people back and forth from the hotel to the exam room or to the exam center for them to take the CPA exam. And so I started doing all of that training in Russia. We had CPA, we started doing CMA, Certified Management Accountant, Certified Internal Auditor. We got into some Russian language exams that were being offered by different organizations. We were involved in translating the CIA exam into Russian, ended up with a very nice large conference center to run all these classes in, and we opened it about a week before the financial crisis in 2008, 2007, in that time period. So lost a huge number of clients just because everybody stopped having events, uh, kind of like what would have happened for a conference center in March, I guess. Um, in the year 2012, we moved back to the U.S. I'm now in Columbus, Ohio, a little bit north of Columbus, if anybody's from Columbus. Um, and we've continued just to sell study materials online. We have CPA study materials, CMA study materials, CIA study materials. We're used around the world. We've had um, just in the past little bit, a lot of business in India, a lot of business in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, um, places like that, a lot of uh, people using our materials. And so the, the background that I bring to this is professional certifications. I've been teaching people, I've been working with people, um, some college students, some, a lot of what we did in Russia were new graduates and also people that were 35, 40 years old that had been in accounting and in that time in Russia, there really weren't certifications prior to that time period. So these were people that were going and getting that certification finally at that point in their career. Um, so we we're you know, teaching people that were older than myself in some cases. But it's all, when we, when we get right down to it, all these certifications, whether it's CPA, CMA, ACCA, SEMA, they're all doing something that should help you with your career. And so that background that I have in certifications is what I'm going to come back to at the end of what I'm going to talk about in terms of jobs and careers and things like that because this professional certification has a tremendous role to play in helping your career, especially at the beginning. But I want to kind of talk a little bit about jobs and careers from perhaps a slightly different perspective than people generally talk about it. And this is something where it's just kind of food for thought. This isn't something that you can go out tomorrow and, and do but it's something that I want you to think about because the earlier you start to think about some of the things I'm going to talk about, the more successful you're going to be as you go through your career. And since you're all in college at, at different ages, different you know, years away from graduating, when we think about our careers, when you're in college and you think about your career, you've got great ideas. Everybody's going to be a partner. Every, you, know, you start counting how many years and then you're a manager and then you're going to become a partner in what office you're going to be in. And we have, I think, kind of a very narrow focus as to what it is that we're 
trying to accomplish, what it is that we're looking for when we're interviewing for that first job. And what I want, what I, what I like to have every part of a, a professional experience, a career and everything that you do, is we need to think a little bit bigger than we usually do. And one of the things that, you know, when you're getting a job and you want to be promoted, you want to advance and all that is, the question is, what is your experience? You, know, you need to have experience in order to get a promotion, in order to get a new job. But if you're in college, you have no experience or very little experience. And so part of the question that we have is, how do we get that experience? And I want to say that there's really two ways that we can get that experience that we're going to build on as we go through our career and that experience and knowledge and skills that we need to get promoted. Because no matter how good of an accounting student you are, right now you don't have anywhere near the skills that are necessary to be a partner. You don't have the technical accounting skills to be a partner. You don't have the, the business professional skills to be a partner. You don't have the management skills to be a partner. But in the time from when you first get hired to the time you get promoted to a partner, you are supposed to gain those skills. You're supposed to gain that experience. And so one of the ways we can gain experience is simply by getting experience. Okay? The only way you can have five years experience is if you work five years. Okay? You need to have two years of experience to get your CPA license. Well, the only way you can get two years of experience is if you work two years. We can't get two years of experience in one year. We can't get two years of experience in 18 months. It's going to take that full two years to get the two years of experience. But there is another way to gain experience that's not necessarily that calendar experience, but the wisdom, the knowledge that comes from experience. And the way we can gain experience that we don't have time to live through is through communication with other people. And this is something that I'm assuming you have opportunities to do at Purdue because in whatever organizations you're a part of, there are professionals who come. There are people who come and speak to classes. There are people who come and speak to the organizations you're a part of, the interview process you go through. These are all opportunities for you to learn for you to listen to somebody who has that experience, who's learned something already, and when they're willing to share that experience with you, when they're willing to share that wisdom with you, you have the opportunity to get that and learn from that for yourself. And this is how people start saying, you hear the comments, oh, they're wise beyond their years. Well. They may only have a certain number of years of experience, but when people listen, people observe, people ask questions, people talk to others, you're able to gain their experience, some of that experience at least, some of the benefits, some of the wisdom from their experience, without you actually having to go through all of that time that they've gone through to experience that. And another thing that, another opportunity, another way to get this, is by reading. And I know that this may sound kind of unusual or something, but reading is a tremendous opportunity for you to gain a, a massive amount of knowledge, a massive amount of experience very quickly in your career. There's a phrase that is that um, I, I was part of a book uh, summary organization. And, and one of the phrases that was talked about was leaders are readers. Understand that people who lead are people who read. And I think one of the ways that that comes out is that by reading other people's experiences and learning from other people through what it is that we read, we have the opportunity to learn from other people's experiences. Obviously, learning from our own experiences is very important. But if we are also able to take on board the experience of other people, to get that perspective of other people, to learn a little bit about how other people see the world, the experiences that other people have in the world, we're able to make that part of our experiences 
which allows us to relate better to more people because we have more, of a, a, more opportunities to make a connection with other people. And that's going to help us lead others because we're able to relate to other people. And so I'm always amazed when I go into a restaurant, and this happened a lot more when I was traveling, you, you go into a, 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 for breakfast, you go to dinner to a hotel restaurant, and I would just see people sitting there by themselves, eating dinner, eating breakfast, and just looking off into space. And I always thought, what a wasted opportunity. I would always go with a magazine, with a book, and there'd be times where if I finished a book or I finished my magazine, I'd be in a hotel room trying to find whatever was in the hotel room so that I would have something to read at breakfast so that I didn't just sit there and look, look around. This was before cell phones were so smart and you could read anything on a cell phone. But it's this reading that gives us the exposure and that experience that allows us to accelerate our own experience. Okay, to learn from other people helps us kind of magnify and accelerate that experience that we're earning as we go through our career. One of the books that I read that I kind of am leading up to all of this is, is the book, um, it's, I think it's still his newest book. Simon Sinek wrote a book called Infinite Games. And in this book, he talks about the fact that there are what are called finite games and what are called infinite games. And the difference is that most athletic contests, most sports, are a finite game. And by a finite game, we know what the rules are. We know what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. We know how we keep score. And we know when we win or when we lose. Baseball game, football game, there's rules. We know what those rules are. Everybody plays by the same rules. And at the end of the game, one team's happy and one team's not happy. And that's a finite game because it starts, you play it, and it ends. And the point of this book, in, in what, what I took from it, maybe it's not what he meant, but what I took from it was that if we look at a company, and a company needs to make certain that it's making its decisions not as finite decisions, but as broader decisions. And the example of a finite decision for a company is something that is a revenue target. We want to have sales of 500,000, 500 million, whatever. We want to have 13% growth. We want to do this. We want it just a short-term measure. It's finite because we know how to measure revenue. We know what is revenue and what is not revenue. And at the end of the period, we can calculate our revenue. And we either did or did not meet that goal. And the problem, though, for a company is when you have a finite game, and the game that you're looking at in a lot of companies are quarter to quarter. We have a first quarter target, a second quarter target, a third quarter target, a fourth quarter target. And because that is our game, that's our mindset of the first quarter and our revenue target, our sales target, whatever, the decisions we make as a company are based on the first quarter based on the second quarter, based on the third quarter, based on the fourth quarter. And a company's not existing quarter to quarter. A company should have a long-term existence. There should be this idea that the company's going to exist for decades. But if the company continues to make decisions that are based on a short period of time and a very specific and finite goal, the company's going to just kind of move very not smoothly, there's not going to be a, a flow or a growth to the company. There's going to be a lot of short-term decisions that are made. And we can see this when companies say, oh, well, we have to get our revenue up to make, meet whatever Wall Street expectations. So the company may offer discounts. They may sell to people they don't normally sell to because those people don't normally pay. They may fire people in the short term because we need to make our profit target. And the easiest way to make a profit target is to get rid of some payroll. So the companies make these short-term decisions as part of these finite games that the company sets for itself, when in reality, the company itself is not finite. The company itself is a long-term part of an infinite game that is 
led not by a specific target, but by a value, by a principle, by a strategic objective. Okay? If we take my company, for a while, my idea or the way I thought about it was sales. Okay? Clearly, it's a small, you know, it's my company, I need money, so the more I sell, the better off I am. But that's also a finite process. I need enough money this month, I need this quarter, I need this year. But really, if I think about what my company does is I want to train people. I want to help people pass the exams they're taking. I want you, if you study with my materials, I want you to be comfortable and confident. I want to support you so that when you go to take your exam, you're confident, you're confident that you're ready, you're confident that you know what you need to know, and you're going to go in and pass that exam and your career is going to continue to develop. And so if my mentality as a company shifts from selling a certain amount of money each month, each quarter, each year, to I want to help as many people as I can. So if I have a great year and I help a lot of people and I make my revenue target, I have whatever that number is in mind, I still haven't achieved my goal because my goal isn't a revenue amount this time period. My goal is to help as many people pass the exam. Well now, because I helped so many people this year, I have a bigger platform on which to build next year. Now I understand that on one level you think, well, with this you're never happy. Okay, you're just always, you know, every year's supposed to be better than the year before, which is absolutely true. It's continuous improvement. Okay, I don't know what class you study continuous improvement in, but some management accounting or control class or something, you talk about the fact that every year we want to do a little bit better. Every year we want our defects to go down. Every year we want our break, break, machine breakdowns to go down. We want continuous improvement. And in order to have that continuous improvement, we need to have a target or a goal that's not limited. That's not limited and, oh, well, we did it, we're done. But it becomes that ongoing thing. Now, for you, okay, we're talking about a company I said I was going to start talking about your job and your career. And this comes back to not only a company and having finite or infinite goals, this comes back to what you're starting to do with your career. And I understand that the economy today, the job market today is very, very different than what you thought it was going to be when you enrolled at school and even 12 months ago. Hey, when you started, when we were this time last year, you had no idea we'd have all the different things that have happened. And so there is a big element of you need a job and you're going to interview and you want a job. But at the same time, I want you to take a step back in this interview process and think about what it is that you want to do in your life. What is it? that you are passionate about. Okay? Now, I understand that we'll just assume that you're all accounting or finance majors or something along those lines. But just because you're going to work in accounting doesn't mean that that's what your career needs to be based on. And so the question I want you to ask yourself is, what are you passionate about? What is it that excites you? What are the hobbies that you have? What are the things that if, you know, class gets canceled one day and you have two hours that you didn't think you were going to have, what is it you want to do? And that passion, what it is that excites you in life, is kind of the direction you want your career to take. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's say you love sports. Okay, it doesn't matter what, you love to play sports, intramural sports, Sports that aren't, you know, broom ball was the one we had at Miami. Whatever sport it is, you love sports. Well, you may recognize that you don't have a career as an athlete. You're not going to go become a professional basketball player or baseball or volleyball or whatever sport you enjoy is. But if you enjoy sports, sports teams have accountants. Sports teams have finance departments. All the companies that are man, um, equipment manufacturers are connected to sports. 
Yeah. I know a guy that I, I went to high school with, loved golf. Wasn't good enough to be a golfer. He worked for Greg Norman's golf company. So he was in accounting or finance, but with a golf company. If you love music, go get a job with a music company. You may not be the singer, but the singer needs an accountant. The music label needs an accountant. If you love animals, there's an application of accounting in all of these different fields that you have a passion about. I knew a guy um, was from England. He ended up in Russia. He did tax work for musicians. And so he loved music. He loved all these. I mean, he worked with a lot of famous musicians doing their taxes. And so he was able to put together the passion of his life of music. May not have been able to sing very well for all I know. But with his career as an auditor and as a tax professional. And so when you're going to these interviews, I understand there's, there's a part of it that is, I need a job. I'm not going to argue a lot at this point in terms of where it is or what the department is, but you need to have in your mind where it is that you want to go. Okay, where is it that you want to go in your career? What are your passions? What are the things that excite you? Even the question of where geographically do you want to go? Okay? If you want to live in San Diego, you like sunshine, you don't like snow, you don't like cold, so you decide you need to live in San Diego. That's fine. It may not be realistic that your first job out of school, you're going to be able to find a good job in San Diego. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But if you can't, the job that you take now needs to be with an eye towards, am I going to be able to go to San Diego with this company? Okay. So you want to work for the big four. Well, Maybe you're not going to be able to interview directly into San Diego right now, but if you go to the big four and you tell people, hey, San Diego is where I want to go, by being proactive and knowing what that longer-term goal is, you can do the things now to put yourself in that position five years from now, two years from now, ten years from now. But if you just let your career go from one short-term goal to the next, I need a job. Okay, you got a job. Well, I want to raise. So you get another job that pays more money. But if you don't make those decisions with a larger picture in mind, it's very unlikely that you're going to end up doing something that you're passionate about, something that excites you. And so you need to know what it is. It doesn't have to be accounting, but what it is that you enjoy doing, that you love doing, and how can you connect your career with what it is that you love doing? An example, I, I, I was an auditor, and I, I say this, and I don't intend for this to be a negative comment, but I did not enjoy auditing. I, it, it just it wasn't something that I enjoyed doing. I can see very well how other people like it. And, and I don't say it's just a, it's a different mindset, it's a different mentality. But I love teaching, and I understand auditing, I understand accounting. So I'm not an auditor, but I use that same skill set that an auditor has. I just use it in the format of teaching instead of auditing. So for you, <laughs> the little career advice and all the different job fairs you go to and career opportunities you go to, don't overlook being a professor. You go get your PhD, you become, you retire to the life of academia. Okay? Ask your professors how much they teach a week. See how many office hours. I'm not saying they don't work. My father was an accounting professor. I know they work. But it's a life. It, it, great, you know, summer vacation, winter vacation, Thanksgiving break, spring break. Don't overlook that. If you love accounting, you love finance, and you love talking to people, and you love teaching, well, you can do that. You just need to make the plans for that. And so as you start your career, as you start interviewing, if you already have, even if, you, even if you've accepted a job, try to keep thinking not about this quarter, this year, this specific job title that you have, but try to keep a little further down the line 
in mind. It was um, a few months ago now, probably April, something like that, we watched the musical Hamilton for the first time. We'd never seen it. It came out on Disney Plus, and so one night we all, as a family, sat down and we were going to watch Hamilton. And, and I'll be honest, I wasn't particularly expecting to enjoy it, but it was great. I loved it. It was very enjoyable. I enjoyed the whole two hours and 42 minutes or whatever it is. But there was a song in there that I kind of think about here as I'm talking about a job and a career. And the song had to do with you need to be in the room where it happens. And I won't sing it because I have no musical talent whatsoever. But it talked about you have to, there's a, there's a room where decisions are made. And in order to have impact in the larger world, we need to be in that room where the decisions are made. Because if you're not in the room where the decisions are made, you don't have as much influence over your career, your job, and all of that. So when we talk about or when we think about, I'm going to be the partner, I'm going to be the CEO, I'm going to be the CFO, I'm going to be President of the United States, whatever it is that you're dreaming of being, kind of a general way of looking at that is you are saying that you want to be in the room where the decisions are made. You want to be in the room where it happens. And John Bolton's book, um, President Trump's former uh, national security advisor, I don't know what title it is that he had, but his book is called In the Room, I think. In the Room, Some, something about you know, being in the room where the decisions are made. And so that's also part of what it is that you're wanting to do. And if that's what you want to do 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you want to be in the room where those decisions are made, you need to start planning that now. Because those people that are in the room, those people that are leaders of those companies, the leaders of the industries, it didn't happen accidentally. They weren't just drifting through their career, one job to the next, and all of a sudden, some Fortune 500 company said, hey, would you like to be our CEO? No, there's a specific process to make certain you get the right skills, the right experience, the right exposures to do that. And so one of the other things that you can do, and I'm sure some of you have already started this, is as soon as possible, and by as soon as possible, I mean while you're still in school, you should start preparing for and passing your professional certification exams. If you want to be the one who gets the job, you need to have something that's unique about you that all the other people that are interviewing for this job don't have. Okay, I'll give you an example. When I was in at Miami, uh, the summer internship I had was with Arthur Anderson, okay, which doesn't exist anymore, but that's a, a different topic and a different story. But Arthur Anderson accepted two interns from Miami that year. And I know who those people were. And every one of us, when we went into the interview with Arthur Anderson, we had the same grades. We'd taken the same classes. We were all in Beta Alpha Psi in the accounting club, and we all did our community. Everybody had a resume on paper that looked fundamentally the same. But they took two people, and the two people they took were me and a young man by the name of Mark. And I don't know where Mark is these days, but I do know that the two people that Arthur Anderson chose for the internships, I believe, were chosen because we were unique. There was something on paper about us that made us different from all the other resumes, all the other interviews that they had. Mark, I was an accounting major, he was in the Ohio Youth Symphony Orchestra playing the violin. So it wasn't that Mark played violin as a child and continued a little bit in high school. Mark was a very, very talented violinist. He was in the Ohio Youth Symphony Orchestra. And so if you're the recruiter from Arthur Anderson, you're the HR person from Arthur Anderson, and you're looking at all these people that all have four points and all the same clubs and all the same organizations, and here's somebody who is a very talented musician, you remember them. You remember that person when you're driving home from all of those interviews because nobody else was that talented of, of a musician. And the reason I was... The second one, I think, is because 
when they asked where I wanted to work, okay, if you're interviewing at Miami, the answers are Cincinnati, Cleveland, or Chicago are the three places everybody says they wanted to work. I said I wanted to work in Russia. So I was the crazy kid who'd taken Russian language at Miami. I was a diplomacy and foreign affairs major before I was an accounting major. And so I was the one that made them make a phone call to find out whether or not they even had an office in Russia. But we were remembered. There's a stack of interviews. You all have the same GPA. You all have the same clubs, the same classes, but there needs to be something that makes you a little bit different than everybody else. And one of the ways you can do that is simply by ideally passing, but even taking a professional exam before you graduate is a way that makes you different. It shows that you're committed. It shows that you understand that you're entering a career. It's not a job. You're not looking for whatever's going to make you the most money in the next 12 months, but you're looking you're saying, hey, I want to be in the room. I want to start better prepared than everybody else. And I know that a lot of people plan on taking the CPA exam after you graduate you, you, and, and all of that. But if you're listening to this and you're a sophomore, you're a junior, and you haven't gone through that final interview process, prepare for an exam. Pass an exam. Take an exam. Because that's going to make you absolutely different from everybody else. Because everybody says, well, I'm going to take CPA when I graduate. I'm going to take it second semester senior year. But if you go into your first semester senior year and you say, hey, you know what? I took an exam last month. I'm scheduled to take the exam next month. You're different. And I, I want to talk a little bit about different professional certifications. And the reason I want to talk about it is because I know that at most universities, the focus is CPA, okay, right? This is what everybody kind of, that's what is advertised. It's what the professors talk about. And CPA is absolutely a wonderful qualification. There's probably the most respected and prestigious professional certification in the area of accounting and finance in the world. Okay, if you are a licensed CPA, you can go anywhere in the world and you'll be able to find a job. So if your goal is to go into audit or tax, Absolutely, you should be taking the CPA exam. But when we start looking at our career and you start thinking about what you're passionate about and you begin to think, you know what, I'm passionate about animals. I want to go to work for a nonprofit to help them manage their business, save money, find those efficiencies. I want to be the accountant for a nonprofit that's, that works with animals. I want to be in the medical profession. I want to work for a hospital. I want to work for a children's clinic. I want to work for a sports team. I want to be in the music industry. Well, CPA may not be the best professional certification for what it is you want to do. And so just because CPA is the most prestigious doesn't mean that it's going to be the most beneficial or the most effective for you in your career and what it is that you want to do. And so when I talk to people about what is the best professional certification for you to take, the answer to that question is to look 10 years in the future. What do you want to be doing 10 years in the future? What's the room that you want to be in? What's that leadership room that you want to be in 10 years in the future? And so what's the qualification? What's the certification that's going to open the doors that you need to be where you want to be. And so CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst, if you want to go into investment banking, then CFA is what you need. That's the certification that's going to open the doors that you need in investment banking. Internal audit, very um, underappreciated profession, being an internal auditor. But if you like internal auditing, if you've seen it in your classes, and you like that idea of, of specializing in a company and being able to help a company across all the operations of the company, well then CIA, Certified Internal Auditor, is the professional certification that you should be pursuing because that's what you need in that kind of direction you're taking your career. 
If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to own your own business, if you already have a business, and you say, you know, after college, I'm going to be able to spend more time on this. I'm going to grow it. I'm going to build it. I want to be a consultant, <clears throat> certified management accountant. CMA is what you need because that's going to give you the skills to run your business, to operate your business, to consult. That's the, that's the knowledge and the skills that you need to work as an accountant in the music industry. For that organization that helps animals, that's the skill set. Those are the things you need to know. And so it may be easiest, the path of least resistance, to take the certification everybody talks about. But if you make your decision about a certification based on what's the easiest one, what's the one you know the most about, you're making a very finite decision about something that should provide benefit to you over your entire career. So when you're looking at something about professional certifications in your education, that's an infinite decision. That's a decision that li that, that's going to help you for the first 10, 15 years of your career. So don't make a short-term decision about something that's going to have a long-term impact on what it is that you want to do and those dreams, those passions that you have. Now, I know that I have a time limit here and there's a limit as to how long anybody can listen to me and I'm getting up to that point. So let me just kind of, before I ask if there's any questions, just at this point in your career, in your life, you're in college, you've got another year, or half year, whatever you have left in college, please try to keep a longer perspective in mind. Try to keep, as you think about your job, as you think about what you want to do, Keep that infinite perspective. What is it that makes you get up in the morning? What makes you excited? What makes you speak with passion about something? And I know maybe you can't do that as your first job. Maybe you say, you know what? I really want to work in the music industry, but you don't have the opportunity. You don't have the connections right now that you're going to be able to get your first job in Nashville. But... That doesn't mean that you can't get your first job thinking about your second job. What's the company? What's the skill set? What's the job that I can get now that's going to help get me closer to that job in the music industry, that job in the sports industry, that job in the travel industry, whatever the case may be. So keep your eyes open. Keep the focus. I understand you need to have a job, but keep a, keep looking further down the road, further down that timeline of your career so that the decisions you make now, the things you do now, the foundation you lay now is going to help you get to where it is that you want to be 10 years, 15 years down the road. As I said, this is what's the room you want to be in and with your jobs, with your professional certifications, make the decisions that are going to help you get into that room where the decisions are made into that room that's the room you want to be in when you get to that point in your career.